Hello, guys. Shall we begin? Yes, we will be continuing with Negotiable Instruments Act. Please confirm is the audio video clear? Yes. All right, so now I'm going to be discussing with you all Negotiable Instruments Act. We'll be quickly running through the concepts. Now we'll begin with the basic points again. First of all, what exactly do you mean by negotiable instruments? What are the characteristics of negotiable instruments? The word negotiable means it is transferable and it can be transferred for n number of times. You do not need the maker's permission if you want to transfer the negotiable instrument. All right, and it's an instrument, so obviously it has to be in writing. It requires signature of the person who is making the instrument. We always assume that there is consideration in the negotiable instrument, but that consideration does not necessarily have to be written on the instrument. All right, and then the we have this concept of holder in due course. Who is a holder in due course? A person who has received the instrument for consideration in good faith and uh, who also has received the instrument before maturity he becomes a holder in due course. And once he becomes a holder in due course, he gets a good title irrespective of the title of the transferor. So these are the basic characteristics of a negotiable instrument that it is in writing, it carries the signature of the maker, there is consideration, but the consideration need not be written on the instrument. It is transferred by endorsement and delivery, or if it's an order instrument, and if it's a bearer instrument, it will be transferred by mere delivery. But to transfer, you don't need the permission of the maker of the instrument. And then we have this concept of HIDC. Now coming to the rebuttable presumptions, what are the assumptions about negotiable instruments? Number one, we assume that every holder is a holder in due course. Number two, we assume that all the endorsements happened in the same sequence in which they appear on the instrument. Number three, we assume that the negotiable instrument is duly stamped. Here the word duly is important. Duly indicates it is stamped exactly as per the rules and regulations prescribed under the Stamp Act. Now, when I say negotiable instrument is duly stamped, this point is applicable only to promise notes and bills of exchange because of course you know in checks you do not have this concept of stamping then number four once i get the proof of protest once i go to the notary public and get the protest certificate from him that is a valid proof that the instrument has been dishonored number six we assume all the transfers after all the transfers happened before maturity and number seven we assume that there is enough consideration in each negotiable instrument Number eight, negotiable instrument, we assume it was drawn on the date mentioned on it. See, today if I'm going to draw an instrument, nothing is stopping me from writing yesterday's date, right? But still, we always assume that whatever date is written on the instrument, we assume the instrument was drawn on that date. And lastly, we assume that the bill of exchange was accepted within reasonable time. This concept of acceptance is unique only to bill of exchange, right? So we assume that acceptance happened within reasonable time. So these are your nine assumptions regarding negotiable instruments. Number one, we assume every holder is HIDC. Number two, we assume endorsements happened in the same sequence in which they appear. Number three, we assume negotiable instrument is duly stamped. The word duly remember to write. Number four, we assume the proof of uh, protest is proof of dishonor. Number six, we assume all transfers happened before maturity. Number seven, we assume that the negotiable instrument was made for consideration. Number eight, we assume that the negotiable instrument is drawn exactly on the date which is written on the instrument. And Number nine, in bill of exchange, acceptance is required and we assume it was accepted within reasonable time. All right. So this is about our discussion regarding characteristics and assumptions. Coming to promissory note, what exactly do we mean by promissory notes? Promissory notes are instruments in writing containing an unconditional undertaking. But those conditions, guys, which are certain to occur, but timing alone is uncertain, those conditions are allowed. Promissory note contains an undertaking. Promissory note contains a promise. That promise, that undertaking should be unconditional. But those conditions which are certain to occur, timing alone is uncertain, those conditions are allowed, right? For example, death of a person. Then 
instrument in writing containing an unconditional undertaking signed by the maker to pay a certain sum of money only to the order of a certain person or to the bearer of the instrument. But then bearer promissory note, you and I, we cannot issue. Only RBI and central government can issue bearer promissory notes. Okay, instrument in writing containing what? An unconditional undertaking signed by the maker to pay a certain sum of money only to the order of a certain person or to the bearer of the instrument. But bearer promissory note, you and I, we cannot issue. Even though the promissory note should contain an unconditional undertaking, those conditions which are certain to occur, time alone is uncertain, those conditions are allowed. For example, death of a person. If I say, I promise to pay A, I promise to pay Mr. A rupees 10,000 upon B's death. It will be a valid promissory note. Yes, I'm putting a condition, but here the condition is something which is certain to occur. Here the condition is something which is which will definitely happen one day or the other. Hence, this will be allowed. Okay, so what are the keywords? Conditions which are certain to occur, timing alone is uncertain, will be allowed. All right, the sum of money has to be a certain sum of money, which means I have to either clearly mention the amount or I have to mention the amount in such a way that it is capable of being ascertained. Either the amount should be certain, either it should be specifically mentioned 10,000 or it should be capable of being ascertained. Capable of being ascertained, for example, if I say I'll pay you 10,000 rupees in five equal monthly installments, I'm not mentioning the amount per installment, but it can be calculated. 10,000 by five, you'll know how much you have to pay per installment. Second example, I am saying I'll pay you 10,000 plus 2% interest. Total how much amount I have to pay you, I'm not specifying, but it can be calculated. It is capable of being ascertained. Hence, again, this will be allowed. Third example, I'm telling you I'll pay you $100 on so-and-so date after converting into INR. After converting into INR, what the amount will be, we do not know right now, but it is capable of being ascertained. So these kind of amounts being mentioned are allowed. Either the amount has to be specifically mentioned or the amount should be capable of being ascertained. One last point about promissory notes, your bank notes, your currency notes, even though actually they are in the nature of promissory notes, the Negotiable Instruments Act does not apply to them because to them, the Indian Currency Act 1871 applies. Also on Hundis, we do do not apply negotiable instruments act then coming to our next discussion bills of exchange what is the definition of bill of exchange bill of exchange again instrument in writing containing an unconditional order promissory note contained an unconditional undertaking here we have an unconditional order even here the order has to be unconditional but those conditions which are certain to occur time alone is uncertain those conditions will be allowed but bill of exchange should contain an order and it should not be containing a request i cannot say please pay me. I have to say pay me. You understand? It shouldn't be containing a request. It should be containing an order. It should be an instrument in writing containing an unconditional order signed by the maker directing a certain person to pay a certain sum of money only to the order of a certain person or to the bearer of the instrument. All right. Even over here, the sum of money has to either be specifically mentioned or the sum of money should be mentioned in such a way that it is capable of being ascertained promissory note if it is payable to bearer we cannot issue only rbi and central government can issue but bill of exchange payable to bearer we can issue then talking about checks even checks are bills of exchange why because just like how bills of exchange contain an order even checks contain an order so checks are bills of exchange drawn on a specified bank payable on demand and includes electronic check and electronic image of a truncated check. Once again, a check is a bill of exchange drawn on a specified bank, payable on demand and includes electronic check and electronic image of a truncated check. Now listen, this we need to discuss a little bit more in deep. Let us say the seller has sold goods to the buyer and the buyer has given a check to the seller. All right. And the buyer has a bank account in HDFC bank, let us say. Now, through a check, buyer is giving an order 
to HDFC bank that take money out of my account and give it to the seller. So checks contain an order, hence checks are said to be bills of exchange. A check is a bill of exchange drawn on a specified banker, payable on demand. Payable on demand means anytime the seller wants, he can go to the bank, present the check and get payment. But of course, he has to go within three months because after three months from the date which is written on the check, this check becomes a stale check. Once the check becomes stale, it becomes invalid and you will not be able to receive money on the check. So it is payable on demand, which means there is no time element. You can go anytime to the banker and you can collect the payment, but please go within three months. All right. So check is a bill of exchange drawn on a specified bank, which is called as drawy banker payable on demand and includes electronic check and electronic image of a truncated check. All right, guys, please remember between these two, what are the differences? An electronic check is, ele is an online check from the very beginning. But electronic image of a truncated check, it was once a physical check. Later, it gets converted into electronic form. Electronic check because this was online from the very beginning. When it was made, we needed DSC. But electronic image of a truncated check, initially it was on paper. So we needed physical signature. All right, now listen. Checks may be crossed or they may be uncrossed. If they are crossed, they may be generally crossed or specially crossed. In generally crossing, in general crossing, I just draw two parallel transverse lines on the face of the check. In special crossing, in addition to drawing the two parallel lines on the face of the check, I also uh, write the name of another banker. All right. So general crossing, I'm giving an instruction to the drawy banker, make the payment only through a banker. In special crossing, also I'm giving an instruction to the drawy banker that make the payment only through another banker. Please remember crossing two parallel transverse lines on the face of the check. It is an instruction to the drawy banker not to make the payment over the counter, but to make the payment only through another banker. In special crossing, I am specifying who that other banker should be. In general crossing, I am not specifying any bank's name. In special crossing, uh, Sorry, in special crossing, I'm mentioning the name of another banker. In general crossing, I'm just drawing two lines without mentioning the name of a banker. But in special crossing, can I write the name of two banks? No. If I write the two, if I write the name of two banks, the banker will not make payment. The banker is getting confused here. So I'm supposed to specify only one bank's name. All right, this is general crossing and special crossing. Now, coming to the next point here, restrictive crossing, this is important. In this restrictive crossing, we have two points to discuss, account payee and not negotiable. Generally, you know, if I am HIDC, I automatically get good title irrespective of the title of the transferor, right? If I'm HIDC, I automatically get a good title even if the transferor's title is bad. But on the check, if the words not negotiable are written, it indicates we are telling to the HIDC, sorry, HIDC, even though you're HIDC, you will not automatically get good title. Your title will depend upon the title of the transferor. Please remember, not negotiable does not mean it is not transferable. Yes, it is transferable. Only thing, we are taking away a huge privilege from the HIDC. We're telling the HIDC your title will fully depend upon the title of the transferor. You will not automatically get good title. Your title will depend upon the title of the transferor. On the other hand, when I write the words account payee, I am giving an instruction to the collecting banker to make the payment only into the account of the payee and not to put the money into anybody else's account. At this stage, I want you guys to be clear with this small summary. Listen, when I do a crossing, whether a general crossing, whether a special crossing, here I am giving an instruction to whom? The drawer of the check is giving an instruction to whom? To the drawee banker. What instruction? Don't make the payment over the counter. Make the payment only through a banker. However, on the other hand, when I write the words account pay on the check, the drawer, this time he is giving an instruction to whom? This time he is giving an instruction to the collecting banker. This one little point I want you guys to remember. In general or special crossing, the drawer is giving an instruction to the drawee banker. And in account pay checks, the drawer is giving an instruction to the collecting banker. One more point I need you guys to remember at this stage, another comparison. Listen, when I do the crossing, crossing is something I do only on the 
face of the check. I cannot do crossing on the back of the check. I cannot do a crossing on a piece of paper attached to the check. On the other hand, when a bill of exchange gets accepted, this acceptance has to be on the check, on the, uh, on the bill. When I say on the bill, it may be on the face of the bill or it may be behind the bill, but it should not be on an attachment. And lastly, when I do an endorsement, whether it is a bill, whether it is a promissory note, whether it is a check, endorsement can be on any of them. Endorsement can be on the face, on the back or on an attachment. Are you clear? Are you clear with this simple point, with the simple summary? Yes, I'll repeat once again, one last time. Listen carefully, guys. Very important discussions happening. Crossing will happen only on the face of the check. Acceptance can happen on the face or back of the bill. Endorsement can happen either on the face or on the back or even on an attachment. And this attachment is called as a launch. All right, now listen. The first summary was general or special crossing. I'm giving an instruction to the drawee banker. Account pay, I'm giving an instruction to the collecting banker. All right, guys, now listen to one last summary. Listen, if it is a promissory note, can I draw a promissory note which is payable to order and it is a time instrument. You know what a time instrument, right? Where I bring an element of time. For example, I will make the payment 20 days from today. Or I'll make the payment 10 days after sight. Or I'll make the payment on 5th January 2023. So can a promissory note be payable to order and be a time instrument? Yes. Can promissory note be payable to order at the same time be a demand instrument? Demand instrument means anytime you can ask me for payment and I'll make you make the payment to you. Yes, promissory note can be an order instrument. It can be a time or a demand instrument. But tell me, can a promissory note be a bearer instrument, which is a time instrument? Can a bearer instrument be pay? Or can a promissory note be payable to bearer and be a time instrument? No, promissory notes bearer payable to bearer. You and I, we cannot issue them. On the other hand, can promissory note be payable to bearer but payable on demand? Again, no. Right? Why? Because bearer instruments only RBI and central government. Now listen, talking about bills of exchange. Can we have a bill of exchange payable uh, to the order and being a time instrument? Yes. Bill of exchange payable to order and being a demand instrument? Yes. Can bill of exchange be a bearer instrument? Yes, it can be a bearer instrument, time instrument. But extremely important point, a bill of exchange cannot be payable to the bearer at the same time be a demand instrument, not allowed. Promissory note cannot be a bearer instrument. Bill of exchange cannot be payable to the bearer on demand. This is not allowed. Talking about checks. Checks, they can be order instruments and payable at a specific time? No, checks will always be payable on demand. Can check be a bearer instrument, time instrument? No, che but a check can be payable to bearer and be a demand instrument. This another summary, important guys. These three summaries which I've given to you all, majorly from MCQ perspective, I hope you all have been able to absorb this really well. All right, promissory note cannot be payable to bearer. Bill of exchange cannot be payable to the bearer at the same time be a demand instrument. Check cannot be a time instrument. A check is always payable on demand. All right, guys, coming back to my discussion here. So we just spoke about what is a promissory note. We spoke about a bill of exchange. We spoke about checks. We spoke about not negotiable crossing. And we spoke about account pay crossing. Now, listen, who can cross a check? Important, two marks question possible. Drawer of the check, holder of the check, or banker of the check. Any of them can in, uh, can do the crossing. Who are uh, What are the three? Drawer of the check, holder of the check, and banker. So these three can cross a check. Now listen, answer my question. I received an uncrossed check. Can I cross it and give it to somebody else? Yes. I received a generally crossed check. Can I specially cross it and give it to somebody else? Yes. Understanding. I received an uncrossed check. I can draw two parallel lines, cross it, and give it to somebody else. 
I received a generally crossed check. Just two lines were written. In between those two lines, I can write the name of another banker. I can make it specially crossed and I can pass it on. I received a crossed check. Can I write the words not negotiable now? Yes, I can. But I received a cross check. Now can I write account payee on the check? No. Who is the only person who can write account payee on the check? Just and only, only and only the drawer, the maker of the check can write account payee. Nobody else can write account payee on the check. Okay, I received an uncrossed check. I can cross it and I can pass it forward. I received a generally crossed check. I can make it specially crossed and I can pass it forward. I received a cross check. I can write the words not negotiable and pass it forward. On the other hand, I received a check without the words account pay written on it. I cannot write the words account pay and pass it forward. Now coming to the next discussion, who exactly is an acceptor? An acceptor is a person, guys, who fulfills three conditions. Number one, he should be drawee of a bill. Number two, he should sign his acceptance on the bill. And number three, after signing, he must deliver the bill back to either the drawer of the bill or to the holder of the bill. Three points. Who is an acceptor? He's a drawee of the bill who has signed his acceptance on the bill and he's now delivering the accepted bill either to the drawer or to the holder. You should be writing this. To whom am I delivering? Either to the drawer or to the holder. All right. Drawee of the bill who has signed his acceptance on the bill and is delivering the bill to the drawer or to the holder. Now listen, when I say signing, just sign is enough. Writing the words accepted is optional. I can just put my signature, even that will amount to fulfillment of the second condition. Writing the words accepted is optional. But after signing, I am supposed to deliver. I signed my acceptance, kept the bill in my drawer. It is not acceptance. I am supposed to deliver the accepted bill. To whom? To the drawer or to the holder. All right, then remember acceptance can be conditional. Coming back to my summaries, listen, promissory note contains a promise, bill of exchange contains an order, check contains an order. These are supposed to be unconditional. What kinds of conditions are allowed? Those conditions which are certain to occur Timing alone is uncertain. Those kind of conditions only are allowed. On the other hand, acceptance, delivery, and endorsement. These three can be unconditional. They can be conditional. Both are allowed. Is this clear, guys? Promissory note contains a promise. This should be unconditional. Bill of exchange contains an order. This should be unconditional. Check contains an order. Even this should be unconditional. But acceptance, delivery, and endorsement, they may be conditional or unconditional allowed. When I talk about acceptance, what kind of conditions can I put in my acceptance? I can put four kinds of conditions. The hint to help you remember the four conditions will be tape. Guys, listen, in a theory paper, as much as possible, avoid using the word etc. When there are four conditions, you write them all. You don't write two and then write etc. No, do not give opportunities to your examiner to deduct marks. You understand there are four points, write all the four. T stands for time of payment. A stands for amount of payment. P stands for place of payment. And E stands for event. All right. The acceptance can be optional. The acceptance can be uh, acceptance can be conditional. The condition can be about time of payment, amount of payment, place of payment or event. In case I make a conditional acceptance, the holder of the instrument should give his consent to the condition. Only then it will be valid. If the holder is not okay with the condition, we treat as if the instrument is dishonored because of non-acceptance. The holder should be okay with the condition. Otherwise, we treat as if the instrument is dishonored because of non-acceptance. If the holder is okay with the condition, the holder should also ask prior parties for their permission. If the prior parties are not giving permission, if the prior parties are not giving consent, they will get discharged. Are we all clear about conditional acceptance? All right, time, amount, place, event. 
holder should be okay with the condition otherwise dishonor because of non acceptance if the holder is okay with the acceptance holder should also ask prior parties for their consent if prior parties are not able to give their consent to the condition those prior parties get discharged one more point about acceptance remember in case the bill is drawn in sets you know what are bills drawn in sets when i have to send the bill to a foreign country for acceptance i draw three copies of the bill and each copy is called a wise i send three copies but the drawee is supposed to accept how many copies he is supposed to accept only one copy remember this also the if bills are drawn in sets the drawee is supposed to accept one and only one copy all right guys one last point about conditional acceptance guys uh, please remember no conditional acceptance i'm done one more point about acceptance remember once the holder or the drawer gives the uh, the bill of exchange to the drawee and asks for acceptance the drawee must give acceptance within 48 hours he is supposed to give acceptance within 48 hours once we present the bill and ask for acceptance the drawee is supposed to accept within 48 hours if he asks for more than 48 hours it will be fine only if the holder gives his consent to it only if the holder is okay with it if holder is not okay with giving more than 48 hours we will treat as if the instrument is dishonored because of non acceptance if the draw he is asking for more than 48 hours to accept the holder should be okay with it if the holder is okay with it all prior parties also should give consent all those prior parties who don't give consent they get discharged then all those hold in case the holder is not okay with the uh, extra time then it will be treated as if the instrument is dishonored because of non acceptance all right so this is it about my entire discussion about acceptance please remember who is an acceptor he is a drawee who has signed his assent where on the bill face or back and delivered the instrument back to whom either to the holder or to the drawer until here no scope of mistake in the examination 100% confident guys yes now listen i'll take you further to the next discussion our next discussion is going to be about acceptor for honor to explain this concept of acceptor for honor i am going to follow this diagram here on your screens did i change the screen correctly just a moment yeah listen acceptor for honor who exactly is he what exactly is the story we will follow these numbers given in the diagram the seller number 1 he has sold goods to the buyer okay the seller has drawn the bill of exchange on the buyer but the buyer has not yet accepted the bill even without getting it accepted seller transfers it to w w to x x to y y to z that is allowed yes of course know where the law says first get it accepted only then transfer know where it is written so yes the seller has drawn the bill on the buyer even without getting it accepted seller has started endorsing the instrument and that is allowed the instrument reaches mr z this mr z is the holder of the instrument now mr z realizes oh my god the instrument is not accepted until now mr z runs to the buyer and asks him for acceptance buyer refuses to accept which means i can say that here there is a dishonor because of non acceptance guys he refuses to accept when he refuses to accept the holder gets this bill noted and protested the next step after this is suing the parties right he gets the instrument noted and protested to protect the honor of one of the intermediary parties mr rex a third party mr c who is not even connected to the instrument enters my story mr c to save the honor of an intermediary party x enters the story with the consent of the holder he accepts this bill i'll repeat again the bill has been dishonored because of non acceptance the holder has got in the instrument noted and protested next step he is going to start suing the parties but before he sues the parties to save the honor of one of the intermediary parties mr x a third party mr c who is not even connected to the entire story enters the scene with the consent of the holder to save the honor of mr x he accepts the instrument 
This acceptance is called acceptance supra protest. Why acceptance supra protest? Because this acceptance happened after the instrument was protested. This Mr. C becomes acceptor for honor. Due date, the holder will ask the buyer one last time for payment. Of course, the drawee will not make the payment. If the drawee does not make the payment, the acceptor for honor has no choice. He has to make the payment now because he had accepted the instrument. This payment which he makes, this is called payment for honor. Once he makes the payment for honor, parties after X, that is Y and Z, they get discharged. All right. And Mr. C, the acceptor for honor, will be able to recover the money back from X, W, seller and the buyer. This is the concept of acceptor for honor. Are you all clear with this discussion, guys? Yes. So one last time, once the maturity of the bill arises, one last time the holder will try going to the drawee and getting the payment. Of course, drawee will not make the payment. He'll say, I did not even accept the bill. Why will I make the payment? He refuses to make the payment. So acceptor for honor, he has to make the payment now because he had accepted the instrument. His payment is called payment for honor. Once he makes the payment for honor, Parties who are after X, Y and Z, they get discharged and X and all parties before him will be liable to accept her for honor. Got it, guys? So this is about our discussion regarding acceptor for honor. Then we have this person called drawee in case of need. Who is a drawee in case of need? This concept is also unique only to bills of exchange. Here, the drawer is asking the drawee to name another person. The drawer will go to this other person if the drawee refuses to accept or refuses to pay. In other words, we are asking the drawee to give the name of another person. In case the drawee dishonors the instrument because of non-acceptance or because of non-payment, then we will go to that other person and we will ask acceptance and payment from him. This other person is called drawee in case of need. But whom will we go to first? Drawee. Only if he dishonors, we go to drawee in case of need. When do we say the instrument is dishonored? We say the instrument is dishonored when both the drawee and drawee in case of need both refuse to accept or both refuse to pay. All right, so this was about our discussion on drawing in case of need. Now, who is a holder? Holder is a person who, if it is a, an order instrument, he is named as payee or endorsee. If it's a bearer instrument, he's a bearer of the instrument. But not just that, he also has the right to possess the instrument and receive money on the instrument. All right, finder of a bearer instrument will never be the holder by Finder of a bearer instrument, he may be the bearer, but he doesn't have the right in his own name to receive money on the instrument, right? So holder is a person, he should, if it's an order instrument, his name should be written on the instrument. If it's a bearer instrument, he should be bearer of the instrument. In addition to all that, he must also have the right in his own name to possess the instrument and to receive money from the parties to the instrument. All right, guys, are we perfectly clear with this? Yes, come on, tell me, are we feeling confident? This is who a holder is. And one more thing, guys, before I forget, holder's title will always depend upon the transferor's title. If transferor's title is good, even my holder gets good title. If transferor's title is bad, even my holder gets bad title. Now listen to the next discussion, holder in due course. Holder in due course is a person who fulfills three conditions. Number one, he gets, a con he gets the instrument for consideration. Number two, he gets the instrument before maturity. And number three, he gets the instrument in good faith, having no idea that the transferor's titles are defective. If all these conditions are fulfilled, he becomes a holder in due course. And once he becomes a holder in due course, he gets a good title irrespective of the transferor's title. Also, once the instrument comes into the hands of holder in due course, it is purged of all defects, it is cleansed of all defects, as if no defect ever existed, which means all subsequent parties, they will all get good title. 
Once the instrument comes into the hands of HIDC, it is purged of all defects, it is cleansed of all defects, and now whoever gets the instrument this point onwards, they will all get good title. Even if that subsequent party was aware of an earlier fraud, even that person will get good title. But a person who was party to the fraud, party to the fraud means what? He has himself done the fraud, that person will never get good title. Conclusion, once the instrument comes into the hands of HIDC, it is purged of all defects. Now, all subsequent parties, all of them also will get good title. Even if the party was aware of the fraud, even then he will get good title. But if he was a party to the fraud, then sorry, his title will forever remain bad. A person who himself did the fraud, he's a party to the fraud and his title will always remain for, uh, bad. Then, listen, we said that if I'm HIDC, I always get a good title. But we know that there are two exceptional cases. What is my general rule? My general rule is that HIDC always gets a good title irrespective of the transfer of title. But I have two exceptional cases when this does not apply. Number one, when in the check, I write the words not negotiable. When I write the words not negotiable, I'm telling the HIDC, your title will depend upon transfer's title. It will not automatically become good title and all. And number two, if there is forgery, if there is forgery, nobody gets good title. Even HIDC does not get a good title. All right. So this was our discussion regarding HIDC. Now listen. In case my instrument happens to be an inchoate instrument, what do you mean by inchoate instrument? What do you mean by inchoate instrument? Inchoate instrument refers to an incomplete instrument. What is inchoate instrument? Inchoate instrument is an incomplete instrument. I'm going to tell you three words now. All the three words have to be written in your answer if the question is about inchoate instrument. An inchoate instrument is an instrument which is SSD. Inchoate instrument is an instrument which is signed, stamped, and delivered. Signed, stamped, and delivered, either wholly blank or some incomplete details. Once again, incomplete uh, an inchoate instrument is an incomplete instrument which is signed, stamped, and delivered, either wholly blank or some incomplete details. Signed, stamped, and delivered, either wholly blank or some incomplete details. In this inchoate instrument, if I write a wrong number, if I write an inflated number, if I write a higher amount than what I should have written, HIDC will still get the entire amount which is written on the check. Listen, the actual amount which I should have paid on the check was 10,000, but the holder wrongfully wrote 15,000. If the holder is just a holder, he will have the right to get only the rightful amount 10,000. But if the holder is holder in due course, he will have the right to receive the entire amount which is written on the check, which is 15,000. Mm. Crystal clear with this discussion, guys? If it's an inchoate instrument, if the amount is wrongly mentioned, holder will get the right to receive only the rightful amount, but holder in due course will have the right to receive the entire amount. Now listen. The next discussion, I'm going to show you an example. I'm going to show you, instead of reading out the question to you, I'll straight away show it to you in the form of an example. In my opinion, highly probable for your upcoming exam. Listen carefully. Imagine a situation like this. I made a check. I drew a check. In this check, one moment. Just a moment, guys. Looks like it got stuck. Are you able to see the printed material now? Yes, right? Yeah. Now listen. Look at the situation here. Mr. A, he signed a blank acceptance and he kept it in his drawer. Blank acceptance means what? Amount is not written on the bill. It's a bill of exchange. Mr. A is the drawee of the bill of exchange, okay? And he has put his acceptance, which means he has signed on the bill and he has kept it in his drawer. 
this mr b stole this acceptance and wrote 20000 number and gave it to mr c mr c is holder in due course you understood the story you understood the story guys yes i'll repeat again mr a is a drawee of a bill of exchange he has signed a blank acceptance signed a blank acceptance means he has put his acceptance on the bill but he did not put any amount what is the amount which is due on the bill all that is blank only which means something is incomplete about the instrument and he kept it on his table let us say and it was stolen away by b b gave it to c c is hidc see no doubt b's title is bad my question to you is what is c's title will c have the right to receive the entire amount on this bill the answer is no mr c even though he is hidc he will not have the right to receive any amount in this bill because in coit instrument we said it should be signed stamped and delivered signed stamped and delivered but it is not delivered he signed, he has just kept it with himself he did not deliver it also acceptance definition of acceptance if you remember definition of acceptor if you remember he said he should be a drawee of the bill he should have signed his acceptance and he should deliver the bill did mr a deliver the bill no there is no delivery over here because there is no delivery the acceptance is not complete the inquiry instrument is not complete hence even though i am hidc i do not get a good title to the instrument all right this is extremely important guys even though i am hidc i don't get any right on the instrument because there was no delivery this example teaches you the significance of delivery see whether you are making the instrument whether you are accepting the instrument whether you are endorsing the instrument i'll repeat again whether you are making the instrument whether you are accepting the instrument whether you are transferring the instrument in all the three delivery is required only then it will be complete will you keep this in your mind even though he is hidc still he gets no title because acceptance itself was not complete not only was the acceptance incomplete it's it's i can't even call it inquiry instrument here because it was signed and stamped but it was not delivered that is why i said remember all the three words signed stamped delivered signed stamped delivered wholly blank or some incomplete details all right so this was about our discussion regarding inquiry instruments and now listen to my next discussion payment in due course payment in due course is payment which is made within the apparent tenor of the instrument which is within the maturity period of the instrument to the possessor in good faith without any negligence without having any reason to believe that the person should not be receiving payment payment in due course payment made within the tenor of the instrument in good faith having no reason to believe that that person should not be receiving payment okay next we have inland and foreign instruments that i will explain to you over here you call an instrument to be an inland instrument if it fulfills two conditions condition 1 condition 2 condition 1 is that the instrument should be drawn in india condition 2 has two sub conditions in between i will write the words or out of these two sub conditions any one condition fulfilled you will say condition 2 is fulfilled condition 2 sub condition number 1 either the drawee should be a resident or sub condition 2 it should be payable in india so an inland instrument is one which fulfills both the conditions number 1 it should be drawn in india and number 2 either the drawee should be a resident or it should be payable in india this is the easiest method to learn about inland instrument i assure you you just cannot go wrong in this method if you look at your study material the way it is worded may get a little tricky all right please follow this instead condition 1 it it is drawn in india condition number 2 either the drawee is resident or payable in india one of these conditions have to be fulfilled so one of these conditions fulfilled you will say condition 2 is fulfilled condition 2 condition 1 both should be fulfilled then it becomes an inland instrument all right so uh, once it becomes an inland instrument uh, the rules of the rules of india will apply once uh, in case neither of the two neither condition 1 neither condition 2 or even one of the conditions is not fulfilled you will say it is a foreign instrument inland instrument is one where both the conditions are fulfilled drawn in india condition 1 condition 2 either draw it should be a resident or it should be payable in india then it becomes an inland instrument 
All right. Now listen to the next point. This point is extremely important about England and foreign instruments. Please remember, if it is a foreign instrument, which law will you apply? Which country's law will you apply? If you have to find the liability of the drawer or maker, if you have to find the liability of drawer or maker, you will see the laws of the place where the instrument was made. If you have to find the liability of the acceptor or endorser, you will see the laws of the place where the instrument is payable. If you have to see the liability of drawer or maker, you will see the law of the place where the instrument was made. If you have to see the liability of acceptor or endorser, you will see the laws of the place where the instrument is payable. You will understand this even better with the help of this question. Listen carefully. A bill of exchange is drawn by A in Berkeley, where the rate of interest is 15%. So who is a drawer? Drawer is Mr. A. And it was accepted by B. Acceptor is Mr. B. Payable in Washington. So it was drawn in Berkeley and payable in Washington. In Berkeley, the interest rate is 15%. And in Washington, the interest rate is 6%. The bill is endorsed in India and is dishonored. Action on the bill is brought against B. We have to find the liability of B. The action is against B in India. What rate will you charge for Mr. B? What rate will you charge for B and A? Tell me, what rate? Mr. B, how much will we, will we ask him to pay? He is acceptor. Acceptor's liability will depend upon the law of the place where the instrument is payable. Where is the instrument payable? Washington. So from B, we can ask him only 6%. But if we had to ask interest from A, how much interest would we ask from A? A is a drawer. Drawer's liability depends upon the law of the place where the instrument was made. Where was the instrument made? Made in Berkeley. There it is, 15%. So drawer's liability will depend upon the law of the place where the instrument was made. Acceptor's liability will depend upon the law of the place where the instrument is payable. All right, this was another discussion, important discussion regarding inland and foreign instruments. Then we have a very simple discussion on accommodation notes and accommodation bills. Accommodation notes are those where there is no consideration and I make the instrument just for the sake of helping a person, right? There is no consideration. As long as there is no consideration in accommodation note, nobody can sue each other. Once consideration steps in, it becomes a trade bill. Once consideration steps in, once it becomes a trade bill, now it can be, now parties can sue each other. Regarding this, I'll straight away discuss with you the most probable examination question from accommodation notes and bills. Listen to my example here carefully. Imagine a story something like this. We have a seller, we have a buyer. The seller sold goods to the buyer. All right. And uh, no, wait. Oh, wait. Let us say between the seller and the buyer, there was no consideration. All right. Still, buyer gave a promissory note to the seller just for the purpose of helping seller. So here I will say that this promissory note is an accommodation note because there is no consideration. The seller have any right against the buyer? No. Accommodation note, no consideration. Nobody can sue anybody. Mr. Seller transfers this instrument to Mr. A. Even over here, there was no consideration. So even here, I will say it is an accommodation instrument. And even here, nobody can sue anybody. Mr. A does not have any rights over them. Mr. A transfers the instrument to Mr. B. Mr. B received the instrument for consideration, which means now this becomes a trade bill. And let us say Mr. B happens to be holder in due course. So holder in due course gets good title also. Now tell me something goes wrong. Can Mr. B sue the prior parties of the instrument? Yes, right. Because number one, he's HIDC. Number two, even though earlier it was an accommodation instrument, now consideration has come in. Now it's become a trade note. So now that it's become a trade note, Mr. B can sue prior parties. But still, Mr. A, seller, they cannot sue anybody. Who is the only person who can sue? Mr. B alone can sue. Till here easy, till here easily you would have been able to handle. But listen to the next part. Mr. B gifts this instrument to Mr. C. Gifts, there is no consideration here. Which means Mr. C is not HIDC. Mr. C is just a holder. Question to you is, what is Mr. C's title? 
how is mr c's title will he have good title or will he have bad title mr c will still have good title why because two reasons number one he is holder and holder's title is transferer's title copy paste holder's title is nothing but same as transferer's title reason one Reason number two, once the instrument reaches the hands of HIDC, it is purged of all defects, it is cleansed of all defects as if no defect ever existed. Right? As if no defect ever existed. So subsequent parties, they will all get good title. All right. This was another important question from your Negotiable Instruments Act relating to accommodation notes and bill. Demand instrument, time instrument, you know very well. Demand instruments are payable anytime. You don't have any days of grace for demand instruments. Time instruments, you do get three days of grace. If nothing is mentioned, you assume that they are uh, demand instruments. Please do not forget this. If I say it is payable at site, it becomes a demand instrument. But if I say 20 days after site, then that becomes a time instrument. After adding three days of grace, if it happens to be a public holiday, known public holiday, then you have to make the payment on the preceding business day. But after adding three days of grace, if it happens to be a sudden emergency public holiday, you have to make the payment on the next succeeding business day. Don't just say preceding day, succeeding day, succeeding day. Say preceding business day, succeeding business day. All right, so this was about demand and time instruments, a small discussion. In maturity of negotiable instruments, I told you you add three days of grace. If the instrument is payable in installments, you get three days of grace for each installment. Okay, if it is payable in installments, you get three days of grace for each installment. Now talking about endorsement, what is endorsement? Maker or holder signs the same, otherwise than as such maker for the purpose of negotiation. I've already taught you this. Where are we doing the endorsement? Back face or even on a slip of paper attached there too. That attachment is called as a launch. Okay. Endorsement maker or holder is signing the instrument otherwise than as such maker. This point is applicable just to the maker. If maker is endorsing the instrument, the maker should sign the instrument again to endorse. This signature will be different from the earlier signature. What do I mean by earlier signature? When the maker made the instrument, that time also maker would have put signature. That signature was in the capacity of maker. Now again, the maker will have to sign. This time it will be in the capacity of endorser. For the purpose of negotiation on the back face or on a slip of paper attached there too. This is called endorsement. Now talking about the different kinds of endorsements, some important ones we will discuss. Number one, we have special endorsement or full endorsement where I write the name of the person to whom I want to transfer and I put my signature. In blank endorsement or general endorsement, I just put my signature without writing the name of the person to whom I'm transferring. When I do a blank endorsement or a general endorsement, my instrument, which was earlier payable to order, automatically now gets converted into a bearer instrument. Once it becomes a bearer instrument, now it will be transferred by mere delivery. This bearer instrument can be reconverted into order instrument. How? By simply converting this blank endorsement into a special or a full endorsement. So blank endorsement is one where I just put my signature without writing the name of the person to whom I'm transferring the instrument. If I do a blank endorsement or a general endorsement, my instrument, which is which was earlier payable to order, automatically gets converted into a, uh, an, a bearer instrument. Once it becomes a bearer instrument, now it can be transferred person to person by mere delivery. But now if this instrument has again to be has to be again converted into order instrument, it is possible how the existing blank endorsement, you can convert that into special endorsement or full endorsement by simply going and writing a party's name. Or instead of doing this, you can also make a fresh special endorsement or a full endorsement. So by converting a blank endorsement into full endorsement, your bearer instrument will again get reconverted into an order instrument. In, and then conditional endorsement, remember I already discussed with you, acceptance, endorsement and delivery. These three can be conditional. In facultative endorsement, I'm increasing my liability. I'm giving up my right. I'm waiving the right to receive the notice of dishonor. I'm saying notice of dishonor waived. I'm giving up my right. 
that is facultative endorsement right then we have sans recourse endorsement under sans recourse endorsement what happens is here the, uh, the endorser, he is escaping from subsequent liability. He says later, even if any dishonor happens, I will not be liable. He is escaping from future liability. That is sans recourse endorsement. Listen to me carefully. Now here, if an endorser has made a sans recourse endorsement, later if there is any dishonor, this endorser will not be held liable. He gets discharged. Okay. He made a sans recourse endorsement and then the instrument comes back to him, let us say. For example, let us say, Mr. A made a sans recourse endorsement to Mr. B. B made a normal endorsement to C, C to D. And let us say D makes a sans recall uh, makes an endorsement back to a and a passes it back to mr e okay so a has made a sans recall endorsement to b b has endorsed it to c c to d d to a and a has passed it on to e now if anything wrong happens any dishonor happens e will sue a a will sue b right no sorry e will sue a a will sue d d will sue c C will sue B, but B will not be able to sue A, right? Let us say A had received the instrument originally from Mr. X. So B will directly sue Mr. X. B cannot sue A because A had made a sans recourse endorsement. So uh, E will sue A, A will sue D, D will sue C, C will sue B. B cannot sue A because A made a sans recourse endorsement. B will directly sue the prior party before X. On the other hand, same thing, if A had not made a sans recourse endorsement, if he had made a normal endorsement, then what would your answer be? In that case, again, if there was a dishonor, A would sue A, A would sue D, D would sue C, C will sue B, B will sue A, A will again sue D, D will sue C, C will sue B. So like this, a loop keeps going on and on and on. When this happens, it is called as negotiation back. Negotiation back, also called as circuit of action. When this happens, all the intermediary parties, parties in the loop, B, C and D, they will get discharged. Right? They get discharged. How to summarize this? If the person who has endorsed the instrument and he's receiving the instrument back, a endorsed the instrument and is receiving the instrument back. If this Mr. A had made a sans recourse endorsement here, then nobody gets discharged. Everybody continues to be liable. Loop does not get created. On the other hand, on the other hand, Mr. A endorsed the instrument and he receive is he's receiving the instrument back but he did not make a sans recourse endorsement here then all the parties in the loop all the intermediary parties they will get discharged because a loop gets created i made a sans recourse endorsement and i get the instrument back nobody gets discharged i did not make a sans recourse endorsement i get the instrument back loop gets created intermediary parties get discharged Okay, so uh, another important concept about sans recourse endorsement we've discussed. Then restrictive endorsement here and ending the negotiability of the instrument. In partial endorsement, I, partial endorsement is not allowed. I will have to endorse the entire value of the instrument. If the value of the instrument is 10,000, I'll have to endorse for the entire 10,000. All right, I cannot do a partial endorsement, but value of the instrument was 10,000, let us say. And let us say the drawee uh, or let us say the acceptor of the bill, he has paid 6,000. So now what is the value of the instrument? Now the value of the instrument is 4,000. For this 4,000, yes, I can negotiate the instrument. It will be allowed. And then in sans phrase endorsement, I am saying I will not be liable for all subsequent expenses. Okay. Then uh, till when can you negotiate the instrument? Even after maturity, you can keep negotiating the instrument till you get money on the instrument. 
all right then another small concept uh, can even a minor be a party to the instrument yes just because a minor is a party to the instrument instrument does not become invalid just that everybody else will continue to be liable on the instrument the minor alone will not be held liable all right then talking about the next discussion liability of legal representative legal representative will be personally liable if he just puts his signature along with the signature if he mentions if he if he restricts his liability just to the assets inherited by him then he will not have any personal liability what exactly am i talking about listen to this example let us say mr a had given the instrument to mr b and mr b wanted to pay to mr c mr b had purchased some goods from mr c for this b had to make a payment to mr c mr b thought to transfer the same promissory note to c so mr b had done the endorsement to c he signed and he kept the instrument ready but before he could deliver he died question number 1 can b is legal representative complete the delivery no legal representative cannot complete the delivery because legal representative is not agent of the deceased person so what the legal representative will have to do is he'll have to cancel this endorsement and he'll have to make a fresh endorsement and deliver the instrument to see when he does this signature when he puts this signature this is what i'm talking about if he just puts his signature then he will have personal liability but if along with the signature if he mentions that he is restricting his liability to the assets inherited then he will not have personal liability in that case his liability will be restricted to the assets which were inherited by him are we clear with the discussion regarding the legal representative okay then remember another point in case like for example if i take this uh, let us say i take this situation or oh, wait or oh, wait let's see let's take this diagram itself let's say there was consideration no not accommodation instrument and all let us say there was consideration a proper instrument a normal instrument all right now if the holder wants holder can cancel the name of any person any intermediary party once name is cancelled gone this person is discharged but if you want to cancel a person's name intermediary party even his consent you need if this person is not giving consent then even this person will automatically get discharged okay this was another point which you should remember then talking about the next point in case you don't present the check within reasonable time and if the drawer suffers any loss because of this then for that loss the drawer cannot be held liable uh, i mean you uh, the, the drawee will be held liable i'll repeat again generally check has 3 months time 3 months validity but i give a check to you and i tell you i am having doubts on the bank you go within 2 weeks itself and you get the payment value of the check is 10000 i am keeping 8000 in the bank account for you you don't go within 2 weeks bank shuts down my 8000 gone you also did not receive money on the check can you come to me and ask me for payment again no for 8000 i am discharged i am discharged for that 8000 because i had kept that money in the bank and that money is gone for me so 8000 to that extent i am discharged 2000 i still have to pay you but for that 8000 you can recover the money directly from the bank account that's the meaning of this concept in case the drawy in case a drawer suffers a loss because the drawy does not present the check within reasonable time to the extent of the loss the drawer is discharged Then forty-eight hours. I've spoken to you about this already. Then listen to this point. This is interesting. When the person who has primary liability, if he itself becomes the holder of the instrument, for example, maker of the promissory note, he itself is becoming the holder of the instrument. Then instrument itself will be discharged. All the parties will be discharged. When when the person who has primary liability, he itself becomes holder of the instrument. Then conditional acceptance. I've already discussed with you. material alteration this i need to discuss with you listen material alteration is nothing but i am making a significant alteration to the instrument in such a way that i am altering the character of the instrument for example i am changing the interest rate i am changing the date the amount the time or the place all of them will amount to material alteration first of all holder shouldn't even do material alteration holder if you still want to do material alteration get the consent of prior parties all those prior parties who are not giving consent all of them will get discharged all those prior parties who don't give consent all of them will be discharged okay but there are some kind of alterations which are allowed by the law for example filling the inchoate instrument 
converting blank endorsement into full endorsement crossing and uncross check they are also alterations but these alterations are allowed apart from these any other material alteration if you want to do you need consent of prior parties all the prior parties who do not give consent they will get discharged when the instrument is with you when you are the holder even if anybody else is doing the alteration it is as if you have done the alteration for example let us say i am the holder of a bill of exchange okay in this bill of exchange the date of payment is 1st january 2023 okay now my no my nephew a 5 year old boy a very naughty boy he is saying i don't like the number 1 he makes this 4 now i did not do the alteration my nephew did the alteration can i give that as the excuse no i am the holder of the instrument i am supposed to take care of the instrument all right when i am the holder any alteration to the instrument even if somebody else has done it it is as if i have done the alteration one another point in case just in case the instrument is materially altered but it is altered so neatly that you cannot even guess that it has been materially altered that is the alteration is not apparent on the face of the instrument on the face of it it doesn't even feel like the instrument has been altered in those cases if the payment is made in due course then the person who is making the payment will be protected there is material alteration still the banker is making the payment why banker had no idea there was material alteration for that we cannot hold the banker liable all right these examples are important guys these examples are newly introduced in your study material hence automatically they become important some extra examples of material alteration alteration by addition of parties tearing a material part of the instrument tampering with the stamp increasing or affixing the stamp then removing the words account pay from the check converting order check into bearer check without the permission of the drawer all these are some special examples of material alteration important important because new additions now if the only material alteration is correcting an error for example i draw a check which is uh, let us say today's date is 16th may 2022 so i was supposed to write date of the check 16th may 2022 right but by mistake i wrote the date like this it's very obvious i made a clerical mistake subsequent party is altering this will this be material alteration no this will not be material alteration because this was to alter a clerical mistake all right then on the instrument no date of payment is written which means automatically it is payable on demand now some subsequent party is writing on the instrument payable on demand this is not material alteration because even if it was not written it was anyways a demand instrument by writing these words we are not altering the character of the instrument hence it will not amount to material alteration all right then talking about the banker's liability remember listen carefully if an endorsement is forged okay still the drawee banker makes payment in due course then the drawee banker will not have any liability drawee banker will be discharged but if the drawer's signature itself is forged even if the drawee banker makes payment in due course drawee banker will be liable for that payment he can be sued for the payment understood if an endorser's signature is forged even if the drawee bank uh, if is the draw if the endorser's signature is forged and if the drawee banker makes a payment in due course drawee banker will not have any liability if the drawer's signature is forged even though the banker is making a payment in due course he will still be held liable clear with all these concepts guys yes are we thorough with this discussion until here yes able to absorb all these concepts able to grasp all these concepts feeling confident a lot of concepts in detail in depth we've discussed from the exactly from the examination perspective this entire discussion with you today guys it's all in and around the examination perspective all right i hope until here you are all taro i'll take you to the next concept now yes listen dishonor of negotiable instrument in case my negotiable instrument gets dishonored it will either be because of non acceptance or it will be because of non payment when do you say it is because of non acceptance it you say it is because of non acceptance either when the drawee outrightly refuses to accept the bill or when the drawee takes more than 48 hours to accept the bill and the holder is not okay with that 
then number 3 when the drawee is making a conditional acceptance and the holder is not okay with the condition and lastly when presentment for acceptance is excused what do you mean by presentment for acceptance is excused if you want acceptance you are supposed to present the instrument and ask for acceptance but there are some cases where you don't even have to present it and ask for acceptance you can straight away assume the instrument is dishonored what are those two situations number 1 when the drawee is a fictitious person the drawee is an imaginary person he doesn't even exist to whom are you going to present and ask for acceptance no need to present you can assume dishonored then when the uh, drawee cannot be found even after reasonable search you are not even able to find him if you are not able to find him to whom will you present and ask for payment to whom will you present and ask for acceptance no need to present assume dishonored because of non acceptance so presentment for acceptance is excused when the drawee is a fictitious person and drawee cannot be found even after reasonable search when do you say instrument is dishonored because of non payment number 1 when the person who is supposed to make the payment outright outrightly refuses to make the payment and number 2 when presentment for payment is excused presentment for payment is excused means generally if you want payment you have to show the instrument and ask for payment but there are some exceptional cases where you don't even have to present and ask for payment even without presenting you can assume instrument is dishonored because of non payment you don't even have to present even without presenting you can say dishonored because of non payment now when does this happen this happens in four situations and the hint to help you remember the four situations is crap number c the place of business is closed we decided i will make the payment to you in my office on 16th may at 7 pm now on 16th may at at 7 uh, on 16th may at 7 pm i should be available at my office but i've shut down my office so my office is closed at the time of payment then r i put in reasonable search even after putting in reasonable search i'm not able to find that person who is supposed to make the payment then a a stands for available we had decided on a third place we had decided that you know you will make the uh, we had decided that i will make the payment to you at a particular restaurant on 16th may at 7 pm you come exactly at 7 pm at the decided place and you wait but i don't come i am not available at the decided place at the decided time i am not available and lastly i am preventing presentment as soon as i see you approaching me to get the payment as soon as i see you approaching me to present the instrument i stop you from presentment for example i shut the door on your face or i send gundas to show you away so here i am preventing you from presenting the instrument to me i am not letting you come and present the instrument to me in these four cases even though you are not able to present the instrument to me and ask for payment it is okay even without presentment you can assume the instrument is dishonored because of non payment okay so this was about the entire discussion regarding dishonor now once there is dishonor you cannot straight away start suing the prior parties first you have to give them notice of dishonor notice of dishonor has to be given to all the prior parties whom you want to hold liable but sometimes what happens is even though you don't give notice of dishonor to a person like let let me explain this to you over here now here let us say the instrument is dishonored all right but mr c gave notice of dishonor just to mr a seller and mr b did not get the notice of dishonor when this happens if mr a wants mr a can pass on the notice to parties before him this is called as transmission of notice party who has received the notice may pass on the no the notice to parties before him but he cannot pass it on to mr b you can pass it on only to parties who are before you this is called as transmission of notice but of course notice of dishonor you will give to only those people whom you want to hold liable a minor even if you give him notice of dishonor it will make no difference a person who makes sans recourse endorsement even if you give him the notice of dishonor he will anyways not be liable so no need to give notice of dishonor to these people similarly no need to give notice of dishonor to person who himself has dishonored the instrument he knows about the dishonor he has himself dishonored the instrument we don't have to give him a notice of dishonor 
Similarly, a person who makes a facultative endorsement, he is waiving his right to receive the notice of dishonor. I don't have to give him the notice of dishonor. All right. So this was about a discussion regarding the notice of dishonor. And now coming to the last part of our Negotiable Instruments Act, Dishonor of Checks, Section 138. This, this point onwards, whatever I'm going to discuss with you, it will all be relating to just checks. Section 138, one section number, which you should be remembering under Negotiable Instruments Act. To explain Section 138, I'll simply give you a sort of a diagram. Listen carefully. Once a check is dishonored, either because of insufficient funds or because the amount of the check was more than my arrangement with the banker, the drawee banker will first of all inform the holder of the check. Once a holder comes to know about the dishonor, within 30 days, the holder is supposed to give a notice to the drawer of the check telling him, please give me payment. Your check is dishonored, please give me payment. Drawer is supposed to make the payment to the holder within 15 days. If the drawer does not make the payment to the holder within 15 days, then after 15 days get over, within the next 30 days, the holder will directly go and file a case against the draw. Uh, the holder will go and file a case against the drawer. The holder will sue the drawer. So 30, 15, 30. Once the holder comes to know about dishonor, within 30 days, he will send a notice to the drawer asking for payment. Drawer is supposed to make the payment within 15 days. If he doesn't, after expiry of 15 days, within the next 30 days, the holder can directly go and file a case against the drawer. If the drawer is convicted, under section 138, he will be punished with imprisonment maximum two years or or imprisonment or fine or both. Imprisonment maximum two years, fine maximum two times or both imprisonment or fine or both all right he will be punished with imprisonment or fine or both this is about section 138 but remember section 138 will apply only if the dishonor is because of insufficient funds or because the uh, amount is more than the arrangement made with the banker if there is a stock payment order or if there's a countermanding payment order that will also come under insufficient funds also remember Section 138 will not apply to gift checks. It will not apply to checks which were given under donations, checks which were given without consideration. Section 138 does not apply to those checks. In case the offense is done by companies, only the company and all those persons who were in charge of the company's business, only they will be punished. Shareholders, promoters will not be punished. Even persons who were in charge of the company's business, even they will not be punished if they prove that it happened without their knowledge or that they exercise due diligence or if they are nominee directors, then even they, these people who are in charge of the company's business, they will not be held liable. Remember, under Negotiable Instruments Act, every offense is compoundable. From here, MCQ question is possible. Compoundable, why do we say? Even section 138, if you see imprisonment or fine or both, when the punishment is imprisonment or fine or both, it becomes a compoundable offense. All right. Then we have section 143A and section 148. Under section 143A, I have uh, the holder of the check has filed a case against the drawer of the check. Under section 138, case is filed, case is still going on. The court can ask the drawer to pay maximum 20% of the amount of check as interim compensation to the holder within 60 days. Maximum extra 30 days can be given. All right. In case later the drawer is convicted, if he's guilty, the court will calculate totally how much the drawer will have to pay. From that, we will reduce the interim compensation, which he has already paid. In case the drawer is acquitted, acquitted means he's not guilty, then the holder will have to return the compensation back to the drawer along with interest at RBI's bank rate. Then coming to section 148, section 148 says the court has already passed an order convicting the drawer under section 138. The drawer is convicted, but the drawer is not okay with the order. Hence, the drawer has filed an appeal, let us say. This appeal is going on. Now, even the appellate court can ask the drawer to pay 20% of the check as compensation. But please remember, section 143A, we said maximum 20%. Section 148, here we will say minimum 20%. Please remember this difference. I hope you've noticed this. 143A, maximum 20%. 148, minimum 20%. 
All right. This is about section 143A and section 148. Section 143A says case is going on in the court. All right. And the, uh, the court can order the drawer to pay interim compensation to the holder. In section 148, court has already concluded that the drawer is guilty. Drawer has filed an appeal. That appeal is going on. While the appeal is going on, appellate court also can ask the drawer to pay this compensation of minimum 20%. 143A maximum 20%, 148 minimum 20%. Coming to cognizance of offences, listen, to which court will the holder go and file a case against the drawer? Metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate of the first class, please do not ignore this concept. A lot of students ignore this, please don't. If it is difficult, listen, I'll simplify it for you. To which court do you go and file a case against the drawer of the check? Under section 138, if you want to file a case, you go to the Metropolitan Magistrate or Judicial Magistrate of the first class. You go to the Metropolitan Magistrate or Judicial Magistrate of the first class. But there are so many Metropolitan Magistrates. There are so many Judicial Magistrates. To which Metropolitan Magistrate, Judicial Magistrate will you go to? Look at the check. See whether it is a crossed check or whether it is an open check. If it is a cross check, see which branch of collecting banker the payee, the holder is having a bank account. In which branch of the collecting banker the holder or the payee is having a bank account. Over this place, which judicial magistrate or metropolitan magistrate has jurisdiction? Jurisdiction means sort of control. Like for example, High Court of Chennai will have control over just Tamil Nadu, right? So that is the jurisdiction of the Madras High Court. Similarly, each judicial magistrate and Met metropolitan magistrate will have a part of, you know, area allocated to them, like this city or this town or that town. One allocation will be there. So see which judicial magistrate or metropolitan magistrate has control over this place where the branch of collecting banker is situated, where the uh, payee or holder is having bank account you will go and file a case before this judicial magistrate or metropolitan magistrate. Similarly, if it happens to be an open check, then you see which branch of drawee banker, the drawer is having a bank account. See which metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate has jurisdiction over this place. You go and file a case here. In case you filed a case before one metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate, and if this case is still pending, this case is still going on, and another check gets dishonored between same parties, then you will go and file subsequent for the subsequent check also, you will go to the same metropolitan magistrate or ju judicial magistrate. I'll repeat again, you have already filed a case, let us say, before a metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate, that case is still pending, the case is still going on. And meanwhile, another check between same parties gets dishonored again. For that other check also, you will go to the same metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate. Okay, and then finally, we say that in case summary trial is adopted, then court maximum you can punish imprisonment one year and fine maximum can be 5000. And lastly, we have speedy disposal where we motivate courts to see this is not a mandatory provision. This is just a directory provision. We are just suggesting to the court that court please try finishing cases within six months. Got it, guys. Yes, that is it about our revision regarding Negotiable Instruments Act. All right. Now I will not again continue with General Clauses Act and interpretation of statutes. Now you go do some learning. So a little later, I'll meet you again and we will do interpretation of statutes and General Clauses Act. Probably we'll meet somewhere around 10 p.m. guys, 10 to 11 maybe. Yes. I uh, now you've it's been one and a half hours of hardcore revision now I let you go and do some studying on your own at 10 o'clock we will meet again and this time we will do general clauses act and interpretation of statutes all right guys so we'll end our session here for now I really hope you guys are feeling much better about negotiable instruments act two chapters we are done revising special contracts and negotiable instruments act Okay, and both these chapters, I think we've done pretty well. I think Negotiable Instruments Act, we've done even better than special contracts. This, I think if you're done with, if you are, once you finish this Negotiable Instruments Act, this video, 
if you are really falling short of time i don't think beyond this any revision of negotiable instruments act you need all right so we'll close here we'll meet again at 10 pm i'll give you an update on the telegram channel that when are we meeting again we'll do the general clauses act and interpretation of statutes thank you guys take a small break of 10 to 15 minutes all right go out into the fresh air for some time come back and then get back to studying thank you guys bye bye